Hey everybody, uh, welcome back here to video number two in a three-part safety series. This one is hazard and system safety analysis. Now, part one, um, I encourage you to go and watch that video. It's really important. It talks about the fundamental aspects of safety from an engineering or from an engineer's perspective, looking at the safety hierarchy that I'll come back and talk about a little more here, but also the engineer's role with respect to the engineering code of ethics, which is really crucial. And basically what it says is engineers have the ultimate responsibility to protect their customers, to protect public health, and, and really need to take that, that role and that responsibility quite seriously. So um, here we're going to talk about hazard and risk analysis. And I really do have only one objective, but I need to go into quite a bit of detail because this, when we do engineering design with BSE 508, and by the way, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that, our senior design program, our students need to be able to do a safety analysis or a risk analysis using a, a technique called failure modes and effects analysis, or also re referred to as FMEA. They are one and the same. And this happens to just be the one that I chose to talk about in this particular lecture, largely because it's one of the more commonly used safety analysis techniques that's used in industry. So speaking of that, I wanna just do a little bit of a quick case study here. And I want to let you know that this is totally imaginary. I'm totally making this up. At the same time, having said that, um, I have been involved with students in the past, either graduate or undergraduate students who have had this type of scenario or who have had this kind of story or experience. I've also been involved with small companies, with insurance companies, and with attorneys in, in the case of lawsuits and product liability claims against engineers and against companies. So I do want you to pay attention because this is real life, this is real world. Even though I'm going to be talking about a bigger company, typically these, kind, these kinds of things will happen with a smaller or middle-sized company where maybe you don't have the right kind of expertise or training among your engineering staff. So do pay attention and whether you're taking this for a class, for a grade, or just watching this for your own professional development, realize that this kind of thing does happen even though it may not be to this, to this extreme that I'll be presenting in this case. So congratulations, you have this new and exciting um, job with a company called Dinero Tractor and Machine, and you have been, you have been hired to, uh, to be the company lead engineer following the release of their newest tractor model. Now this tractor is really cool. This tractor is fully autonomous. It can be run in a fully autonomous mode. It can do all field operations without the need for a human operator. So it's essentially remote controlled. You can do field operation. You can do uh, road operation, traveling from field to field or from farm to farm. You can hitch and unhitch implements, which is a particularly dangerous activity, by the way. It will also accommodate a human operator so that if you've got somebody who says, you know, I'm spending three quarters of a million dollars on this machine, by, go by golly, I want to be able to jump on it and drive it. You still have that opportunity to override the, the automatic controls. In theory, an operator can be located in anywhere in the world, and you can still perform all of the normal operations that a tractor might perform because it is so equipped with sensors and cameras and remote control and all kinds of really cool technologies. So here we are. We're still kind of in the winter of 2021 when I'm recording this particular presentation, and the sales for this dinero tractor have been wildly successful. You've sold about 1,600 units. They're located around the world, but you have a heavy concentration in the upper Midwest. A lot of them, 1,600 tractors. And you're really excited because pretty soon the spring planting season is going to get rolling as soon as the soil thaws and gets warm enough and as soon as the snow melts. And when that happens, you're going to begin seeing all this data coming in from these tractors and from these machines, again, all over North America, all over the world. And on day one of your new job, you're so excited and you want to get more. You want to dive deeply into the nuts and bolts and into the beating heart of this project. And you want to see the project design specifications, right? You need to have created those if you're developing a product like this. And part of that, um, you also want to make sure that you see the stuff that's been done with respect to safety. For example, safety standard ISO 25119-1, uh, which is the one that is connected to 
uh, principles for tractor and machinery safety, in including automated and, and fully autonomous equipment, as well as other standards that came about in 2018. So like you're asking your team, like, I, I want to see this. Could we, you know, could we put all this in a shared drive? Could you bring it to me? It could be hard copy if you want to share it that way, but I really would like to see it all. And when you ask for the safety standards, your team is at a little bit of a, they're at a bit of a little, they're at a little bit of a loss. What? Safety standards, uh, risk analysis, failure modes and effects analysis. Well, we kind of looked at safety. We considered a lot of things, but we didn't necessarily formalize our approach. This is the kind of thing that does happen from time to time in some areas of industry, whether you're talking about small agricultural equipment or other types of industry or environmental projects or projects that involve food production or food processing or energy processing machinery or systems, these are things that we need to be looking at. And these are the kinds of questions that we need to be asking. But by the way, we should be asking about them upstream from the product release rather than downstream and rather than after the fact. So one of the things I would really like for you to do, if you are taking this class, you, you have to do this, by the way, there will be a discussion assignment, look on Canvas. And in that discussion assignment, I've got these three bullets. Number one, I want you to describe at least five hazards from this case study that could be associated with this machine. By the way, think about mechanical hazards, yes. Think about things like downtime hazards, be able to describe those. And you might also wanna be a little bit clever. Think about the digital nature, the fully autonomous nature. So think also a little bit about some of those aspects in addition to just thinking about pure uh, rotating mechanical energy, kinetic energy types of hazards. They are abundant in this particular situation. I also want you to think about, okay, if those hazards manifest themselves, um, what, are, what are some of the things that are going to happen? What are some of the outcomes and what are some of the consequences? So five hazards, five potential ways in which this product could fail. And by the way, that can be connected to these hazards. And then finally, five specific outcomes or consequences associated with those failures. And guess what? That's the kind of thing you do when you do failure modes and effects analysis. So let's talk about that. What is failure modes and effects analysis? Failure modes and effects analysis is a method used in systems safety, or it's a safety management tool or principle. And there's a lot of these. I mentioned here at least 10 formal official ways to analyze and control risk, hazard identification, uh, job safety analysis, also sometimes referred to as job hazard analysis. Um, and that's going to be really important, by the way, if you ever work for a, a company and you're responsible for tasks and processes that involve people. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but HAZOP is one used in the chemical industry. Chemical engineers often will think about and use HAZOP, fault tree analysis, and you see the rest of the list, including at the very end, failure modes and effects analysis. I happen to pick this one out because I think it is broadly generalizable across all of the sectors in which BSE works, food and food and bioprocessing, natural resources in the environment, and also machinery systems, it can really be applied to any type of a risky process or a risky product. All of these techniques that I have talked about are based on the identification of hazards. What is a hazard? A hazard is something that could, uh, it could be a condition or a tangible thing. It could be a substance or other sort of condition that has the potential to cause harm. And in the first video, I talked about some of those forms of harm, accidents or injuries, which is what we prefer to call those, property damage, long-term loss, pain and suffering. I'm not going to go into those in detail. They could, be, they could be mechanical hazards. They could be contaminants or chemical hazards like pesticides or nitrates in our groundwater and drinking water. It could include a pathogen like a bacteria or a virus. So an example there in the food industry would be the prevalence of E. coli O157H7, which is a particular type of E. coli bacteria, which we know can make people quite sick. Uh, young children in particular, that's the one we think about when we think about undercooked ground beef and hamburger. Um, other types of physical hazards, noise, sunlight, vibration, other types of exposures. 
It could be the uninsulated wire providing power to my dishwasher. So we've got to think about electrical hazards. We have to think about potential hazards becoming uh, potential energy hazards becoming kinetic energy hazards, as is the case with a falling chunk of ice. And I am going to come back and talk about that here in just a moment. What's really important about hazards and about failure modes and effects analysis is we have to also think about the way in which these hazards manifest themselves. And we should think about it in this way, we think about the hazard. So the quality of the hazard, the measurability, can we quantify it if it's a moving part? That moving part, that shaft, or that uh, that part that's, you know, move, or that vehicle that's moving down the highway has a certain mass, it has a certain amount of kinetic energy, it has a certain velocity. Um, we can predict what the impact forces will be. Um, so each hazard has unique um, characteristics. If we're talking about chemical or pesticide hazards, one of the things that happens there, we have to look at the toxicity. How toxic is it? Which is sort of analogous to a moving part hazard. We think about kinetic energy with chemicals. We think about toxicity. So we need to understand the characteristics of the hazard. We also need to understand the characteristics of the person. So oftentimes we're talking about a person or people, multiple people, maybe a population, maybe a community, or when we look at something like a pandemic, we're really thinking about the characteristics of the global population and understanding like what are the unique aspects of that global population or what are the unique aspects of the person, the individual person who will be using my product? What language do they speak? What is their background? Can they read? Are they old? Are they young? Those are the kinds of uh, people characteristics that we need to think about. And I'll come back in our third video and talk a little bit more about some of those people or human factors that are important with safety. The last thing we need to think about, remember, we've got hazard, we've got the person, and we also have the environment in which these things come together. We've got the physical environment. That's the weather, the temperature. Is it icy? Is it cold? Is it wet? Um, what's the relative humidity? Is it slippery? What's the coefficient of, of friction on the surface that people are walking on or interacting with? We've also got other types of environment. We've got to think about the social environment. We've got to think about the degree of other people's involvement. If I am a farmer and I am on a small farm working by myself, that's a very much more unique social environment than working on a larger dairy farm where you might have 15 hired employees. And by the way, those 15 hired employees, if it's a Wisconsin dairy farm, half of those workers might speak Spanish. So we need to think about the people characteristics in combination with the social environment or social characteristics. We also need to think about the political environment. If we're selling a product into a market and we've got people and hazards coming together, is there regulation? Do people follow those regulations? Is there concern? Or if we, if we force a person to do something politically for safety reasons, are we somehow taking away their rights or are we impinging on the rights of other people? So all of these complexities need to be considered. And again, when we talk about culture, um, certain cultures or some cultures have differing levels of risk acceptance. That's really beyond the scope of what we can go into in this particular talk, but that's really important to know. How willing is my audience and my product user to be able to take risks or, or protect themselves from risk if they are not protected through an appropriate design? Um, what about my adherence to a, ethical codes and expectations? And then also gender. Um, people of different genders and different cultures, again, have different levels of risk, which they are willing to accept. It's also very much dependent on age. So there are lots of things we need to think about in this combination of the person, the hazard, and the environment in which they all come together. So let me just give you a quick illustration. I think a lot of you who, who live or work on campus, UW-Madison, in Madison, Wisconsin, you probably know this particular area, this is the area right behind the Steenbach Library, okay? So it's between the Steenbach Library and Lot 36, which is a very popular parking uh, 
uh, lot. It's a parking garage on campus, and you see this very well-used walkway. But you also see that there's part of the walkway, including the shortcut on the back side of this picture that's roped off. Why is it roped off? Well, you can see to some extent because there's a lot of snow, there's a lot of ice. Ice and snow removal is difficult because of the narrowness of the pathways between these two structures. But here's the other reason why things are roped off and why traffic is controlled, because you've got this potential risk and hazard associated with falling snow and falling ice. Falling snow, not that big of a deal. A falling chunk of ice, as you will see, has a pretty dramatic potential to cause serious injury or even death. And actually, Many years ago, as I was putting this lecture together and I had my iPhone with me, I pulled my iPhone out, I was looking up at the top roof, and I just happened to capture these pictures of these two chunks. One was a relatively fluffy chunk of caked up together snow, and the other one was a pretty large block of ice. And I'll talk about how large it was in just a moment. When the snow hit the ground, it kind of poofed. When the large chunk of ice hit the ground, it actually made quite a racket and quite a thud on the concrete at the time that it impacted. So because of this hazard, because of this risk, and because you've got people coming together in a potentially hazardous environment and you've got a known hazard, the university has employed the safety hierarchy. Remember that we talk about engineering out the hazard? Well, in this case, they didn't do that because you've still got a roof which is forming ice and that ice is dropping. So instead, what they've decided to do is to promote or use safeguarding devices. In this case, the ropes, the yellow tape, uh, supposedly prohibiting, prohibiting you from going into the dangerous areas. And then you see that they've, they're also using warning signs. Danger of falling ice. Now, if we go back to video number one, where I talked about the safety hierarchy, remember that I said that engineering out the hazard entirely is preferred. Because when we talk about going to that next level, employing safeguarding devices, barriers, uh, barricades, in the, in the case of this particular slide, or ropes across pathways, there are times when people will bypass those safeguards and, and it makes that particular safety strategy a little bit less effective. And likewise, we see danger falling ice signs all over campus and there comes a point in time where, yeah, we see this. We see this every day. We may or may not choose to believe it or we may choose to ignore it. For example, if I am the owner of that Trek bike back behind the barricade and I need to get at my bike, am I going to wait? Am I going to totally follow the advice on this safeguarding device or am I gonna go back there and grab my bike because of the utility that's provided when we take that kind of a risk? So a really great illustration of the application or um, I could argue the lack of application of the safety hierarchy to its fullest extent. By the way, let me just say for students who are in my department in BSE, Biological Systems Engineering, we have the same hazard in the back of the building. And we have, it's a little bit of a smaller area, but we also have a door back there that sort of invites people into walking into that same exact environment. We're, we've been fortunate, we've not had a serious injury. We're, we're choosing, or the university is choosing to handle it with signage, uh, with, care, you know, be careful, uh, caution, falling ice, and in some cases even locking that back door so that you can't use it during these dangerous times. Thankfully, we've never had an injury. We have had property damage to vehicles, but just know that that is out there and that these things abound um, across any type of environment that you live or work in. So again, when we talk about the falling ice hazard, we have to think about it in terms of this triad or this triangle that includes the hazard, the person, and the environment. The ways in which they come together and we can really influence safety by looking at all three of those together. I wanna to just go back and kind of drill home a little bit more on this idea that when you've got a hazard, it is a, it is a physical or a, a, a thing, a substance or a product or a chemical or a form of energy that you can in fact analyze from an engineering perspective. In the case of the falling ice chunk from the back of Steenbach Library, it's basic physics, right? So you've got a building which is roughly 35 feet tall or a roof which is uh, approximately 35 feet tall. 
I, when I would watch these chunks of ice fall, this is just off the top of my head, just from using my camera and watching things fall and being there in person, about two thirds the size of a typical one gallon milk jug. So we're probably talking about five to six pounds per piece of ice, at least the pieces of ice that I saw. Um, note again that the fluffy stuff floated and the heavy crusty ice crashed down pretty hard. So we've got a three kilogram object falling from a height of 10 feet if we ignore air resistance at the time of impact. Hopefully it's not on top of a person's head. Even a glancing blow is gonna cause bodily damage, but we've got a piece of ice that's traveling at approximately 14 meters a second, which is about 31 miles an hour, and it has a kinetic energy equal to 294 joules. We can take that number and we can calculate what is the impact force. If we know the kinetic energy and we know the stopping distance of that ice chunk when it hits, we can calculate the force. And if we just make the math easy, if we put in a stopping distance, it could include some deflection. Maybe it glances off the person without a, without a direct hit. Um, I don't want to go into a lot of detail. We also have a little bit of stopping distance because of our bones and muscle structure. But if it hits my head, we may see a, a stopping distance of a tenth of a meter. So what's that? Three, three and a half inches of deflection distance. The impact force is going to be really big, 2,900 newtons. And that is, if you look at charts from mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, or places like NASA, we know that a human force exerted onto a human being, depending on the body part of 2,900 newtons, can be very serious and result in deadly or disabling injuries. So we can quantify even something like a falling chunk of ice and its potential for doing damage. We could do the same thing across campus, right? Like we could look at, okay, what are the other hazards? We got falling ice. We've also got, if I'm uh, riding on a bus a couple hours a day or even 45 minutes a day, I'm gonna be exposed to viruses and pathogens. Um, during the time of the pandemic, this was like a really big deal. During times of normal uh, winter time or springtime, we're dealing with influenza, the common cold, other types of pathogens. Um, and by the way, those have different levels of severity. If I do get infected, I would much rather have a common cold than coronavirus. We also have hazards associated with getting onto and off of the bus. I could slip and fall. Probably not going to be a big deal, but it is that it is there. It is a potential hazard. We've also got hazards associated with crossing um, sidewalks or crossing uh, roadways, whether it's University Avenue or Linden Drive or State Street. There are differing degrees of hazard. We've got ice on the sidewalk. We've got ice on the steps of these buildings. We've got the falling ice that I talked about, both from Steenbach Library, but also from the BSE building. We've also even got risks associated with classes that are all done for the day. I decide I'm gonna go to the Starbucks on State Street. I'm gonna pull out my books and my laptop computer, and I'm gonna study for two or three hours, and I'm gonna grab myself a mocha. Are there risks associated with that? Well, yeah, actually, unfortunately, there are. There are risks in everything that we do. And one of the things that's really important as an engineer, when you are responsible, the person responsible for your product or system, you have to have a way of, of quantifying these risks and you need a way of prioritizing. You don't have unlimited money. The University of Wisconsin-Madison, I talk about all these hazards we're faced with as faculty and students. We don't have an unlimited cash box to be able to fix all of these. And some of them, by the way, are not necessarily our direct responsibility, but we need a way to quantify the risk, to evaluate the risk, and again, to set priorities. So the way that we do this, the way that we analyze risk is oftentimes based on concepts of probability. How likely is it for this hazard to actually manifest? That is the, the hazard being present and a person coming in contact with the hazard. It could be a person or it could be a population. But then we also, it's not just probability, we also need to look at severity. So if the severity of stepping onto a bus, tripping and maybe banging my chin or maybe just being a little bit embarrassed, if the severity of that is relatively low, even though the probability might be high, it's not a big, huge hazard that we need to spend millions of dollars trying to fix. 
So what we could do <laughs> and what I will do here is let's take a look at these hazards as identified associated with being a student or a faculty member here on campus. We've got the virus, we've got the entry and exit onto the bus, we've got the crossing the street, the ice on the sidewalk, the falling ice, uh, both on Steenbach, but also on ag engineering. We're gonna look at those separately, by the way. We've got the mocha at Starbucks. And by the way, we could, we could burn ourselves. Like I like my mocha, my latte actually. I like it extra hot, I could burn myself. And we've also got the potential for foodborne illness. And what we do is we map these hazards on this matrix. It is far better to do this as a team, as a group of people, because it doesn't really matter exactly where you put each of these. You gotta kinda get them in the general ballpark. You're looking at the relative risk, and the best way is to bring the knowledge from the entire team together for this risk analysis process. So it might look like this. Um, virus on a bus, by the way, represented by A. And you notice that I have uh, three A's on this chart. So when you begin to analyze risk, let me see if I can see my cursor here. I can. You'll notice that there's an A in the upper right-hand corner. There's an A here kind of in the middle in terms of severity. And there's an A down here at the bottom. So what am I doing? So when we talk about virus, that's pretty broad in general, right? Okay, if we're talking about the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, the COVID virus, like for me as an individual, if I'm riding on a bus and I am not vaccinated, the probability of my being infected is pretty high. It's, it's a level that I don't feel comfortable with. And as a 60 year old guy, a 60 year old man, if I get sick, the chances of me ending up in the hospital or ICU or intubated, or even worse than that, the severity for me could be really high. So I put myself here as the A in the upper right-hand corner. For you as a college student, assuming that you're healthy, that you don't have any pre-existing health conditions or comorbidities, still, still a high probability. In fact, your probability might be the same as mine, um, but your severity is probably going to be lesser. Again, if you're healthy with no co comorbidities or no pre-existing health conditions. When we look at viruses, we also need to think about like the common cold or influenza. So I put the common cold down at the bottom. Ah, pretty good chance if I'm riding that bus on a daily basis and I'm not doing anything to protect myself, um, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to get sick. However, if it's common cold, probably not going to get terribly sick. So a lower severity. So the idea here, when I've got these three A's on this chart, is you've got to be pretty specific. You've got to define what is the hazard? Like, what exactly is it we're talking about in a fair level of detail? Similarly, I took the, the risk of falling ice. It's different between the two buildings. We've got the BSE, the Ag Engineering Building, and we've got Steenbach Library. Those are two different structures. So the probability of a chunk of ice hitting me near the Steenbach Library is pretty small. There are no doors that walk directly out to the falling ice hazard. And yet at the same time, the probability or the severity if that if that chunk of ice hits me is going to be high it's going to be either serious serious injury disability or it could even cause death the probability with f that's the ice falling from the ag engineering building is a little bit higher because i've got a door that leads right out into that potential area of hazard exposure so the idea here is you map out these hazards, but you also have to be very specific. The same with G and H, uh, the probability of me burning myself from my hot mocha or my hot latte, ah, pretty decent probability. I might scald my tongue or burn the roof of my mouth. Severity, uh, pretty low. Uh, it's maybe almost off the charts low. Um, and similarly, uh, the H is the potential for foodborne illness. Actually really low probability, but if I were to get something like E. coli or salmonella, um, salmonella probably would be more likely. It would be perhaps from an unpasteurized product. Th the severity could be very, very high for me. And the good thing about that is this, the probability is very low. And that doesn't just happen by accident. That happens because a company like Starbucks does this. They do 
risk and hazard analysis. In the food industry, they do it a little bit differently. Um, they, they use a protocol which is similar to FMEA. It's called HACCP, which is about assessing hazards and determining critical control points. But the fact that it is a very low probability, that didn't just happen accidentally. That happened because they took very, very specific steps to assess their risk, develop priorities, and then develop the types of engineering controls and other types of protocols to protect people from foodborne illness. Couple questions here. Number one is where do I spend my most time and effort? Obviously the yellow shaded area, if I go back to this slide, the yellow shaded area is where I'm gonna wanna make sure I take care of those hazards. I wanna find ways to engineer out those hazards and get rid of them so that they don't exist any longer. Why? Because it's high probability, high frequency, or high probability, high frequency, and high severity. If I get sick from COVID, high probability, there's a good chance that I'm going to end up really sick based on my age and based on my health status. Um, likewise, even though something is low probability, again, let me go back to, to this next slide, even though it might be low probability, if it's high severity, I also probably want to pay some decent attention to those. Again, we've got the Steenbach Library, E, and we've got the Ag Engineering Building, F. We've chosen to do something about that. We've chosen signage and we've chosen barricades, including locking that back door during these dangerous times when ice is falling. So just because something is low probability, if the severity is really on that upper end, you probably want to spend some time and resources thinking about how might I mitigate that potential risk you might say, well, what about G, B, and E? G, B, and A down on the bottom. The common cold is A, right? Uh, B is the getting onto and off of the bus, and G is my <laughs> Starbucks burn uh, picking up my mocha. Well, if I can employ a relatively inexpensive um, intervention or way of controlling those hazards, it's good to do it. If, if I can do it, if it's low hanging fruit and I can knock those hazards out so that they're no longer an issue, um, even though they're relatively low probability or low severity, it's good to go ahead and do that. That's why when I go grab my latte or my mocha at Starbucks and I ask for an extra hot, it's going to have a sleeve that I can use. That sleeve that cardboard sleeve that insulates the cup from my hand is a form of a safeguarding device. I'm, I'm physically separating my hand with a device that is going to protect me from those kinds of, of burns. Um, I would actually predict, because they are relatively low cost and they are effective at the uh, mitigating the transmission of viral particles, I will predict that for the rest of our careers, we will see people on crowded buses in Madison and other cities wearing masks. They're a safeguarding device. Um, I don't have to worry that much about the common cold. They're a nuisance. They cause me a lot of like headache, literally, and, and maybe some lost time and some lost productivity. But there's a relatively inexpensive way to mitigate that risk. So even though something is lower in terms of either probability or severity, it's still smart to go ahead and try to find ways to think about mitigating risk, particularly if you can do so inexpensively and if it would be considered to be, again, what I'll just sort of call low-hanging fruit, where you get a lot of bang for your buck. So all this brings me to, believe it or not, this all leads us to this model or this method called failure modes and effects analysis. So let's just take a look at my moped. I'm gonna apply failure modes and effects analysis to my moped. When we do this, we systematically look at all the hazards, all the ways and modes in which this thing could fail. There's a lot of things you could talk about. We could have failure of brakes. We could have failure of the fuel system. We could have failure of the tires, uh, other mechanical systems, the drive unit. Um, we could have fire on this particular thing. We could have electrical system failure. So there are lots of ways that this could fail. We think about like specifically what are the modes in which it could fail. And then we look at each of those modes and the consequences associated with those modes. And we assign a probability and a severity. 
And the other thing we want to do is to assign a detectability. The idea of detectability is if we have something around us, which is really hazardous, but it's not very detectable. Again, I think about the, the coronavirus in 2020 and 2021, high severity, relatively high probability, but not very detectable. And you guys all know that. Um, that is something that would score higher in terms of risk because we it's not obvious. We don't obviously see that it is going to be something that's going to cause a problem. Just really quick example. So detectability of coronavirus on a bus, really low, which is going to give it a higher, a higher score when we do the equation for risk because it's a higher number, because it's a, a higher risk, it's going to give a, a higher risk score. On the other hand, um, detectability, if I'm worried about burning my mouth from a hot cup of mocha at Starbucks, I pick that thing up. It's very detectable that that's hot. It's also very detectable because I ordered an extra hot mocha. So detectability, the detectability score, detectability is high, but the detectable, the detectable score is going to be low, which is going to mean it's a lesser risk um, hazard in this particular case. And the priorities are scored based on the product of these three variables, the probability, the severity, and the detectability. So just really quickly, let me go through this. This is going to be the spreadsheet that is in your module that you will be using to apply to your particular product, your design, your system, or, your, or, or whatever it is you're designing in this class. So I look at my moped, and I don't want to go through all of these, but I just looked at one system. I only looked at the moped, the wheels and the tires and the attachment points. And I went through and I identified many different hazards and many different ways or, or failure modes, ways in which this product could fail that could cause some level of risk to me. Flat tire, kind of a gradual flat tire versus a catastrophic flat tire. Those are two really different scenarios. A tire that I'm driving down the highway that's maybe underinflated. Um, and actually, I ended up selling my moped because I wiped it out. Um, I was at a quick trip. I was going to the quick trip actually to inflate my tires, and I encountered a patch of ground limestone that had spilled out over a truck, and I lost control of it. Thankfully, I had a helmet, banged up my arm and my wrist a little bit, but I was fine. But the risk from underinflated tires is really significant. You could also have a wheel that becomes unattached because of a part failure. Or because I took that part off, I took that wheel off and I failed to reattach it correctly. So each one of these would need to be examined differently. And each one would have its own associated probability or frequency of failure. It, each one would also have its own level of severity, and the consequences of failure. Each one would also have a slightly different level of detectability. So if I have a tire that's underinflated or uninflated, um, detectability is pretty easy. I'm going to have a relatively low, I can look at the tire and I can say, hey, my tire is really low. Um, if I, in, instead, I'm driving down the highway and it looks like my tires are good, inflation is proper and everything's going well, and suddenly I have a catastrophic tire blowout, that's really hard to detect. It's not like you can warn a person or prepare them for that type of emergency. Again, the idea is your net level of risk is the product of probability times severity times detectability. The higher the number, the more risky it is, the more it would appear up in that upper right-hand quadrant of your risk assess assessment matrix. And the more important it is that you spend time and money and effort controlling that hazard preferably in the design process. And how do we do that? We do that by applying the principles and the categories of approaches in the safety hierarchy, which ties us back to video number one. Let me tell you a couple other things. When you do this homework, you'll notice that down at the bottom, there are tabs and suggested uh, scales for probability, severity, and detectability. I encourage you to use those. There are other published scales if you don't want to use these or if these don't quite work for the product or the system that, you're, that, you, are, um, that you are designing. But it is important that you really look at this in a systematic way and that you set priorities. Let me say one other thing. You may be designing a product like for Dinero Tractor and Machinery Company, and that tractor 
if you truly do a failure modes and effects analysis, it might have a thousand hazards. And you obviously do not have an unlimited budget to spend to protect people. So when you have a more complex product, this failure modes and effects analysis thing is even more important than with something that's smaller, like my moped example here. My last slide. With failure modes and effect with failure modes and effects analysis, what is really crucial is that you use this as a tool to prioritize your actions. The actions are the key. If you just if your actions are we're going to put warning labels and we're going to train the users of our products, that is not adequate. You do need to find ways to control these hazards in a manner that is consistent with the safety hierarchy. And just remember, warnings and personal protective equipment, while useful and while necessary, are not adequate. Um, and by the way, I do wanna just caution you, failure to warn, the failure to provide the warning labels and instructions on a known hazard, that's actually really bad. If you if you fail to warn people as an engineer, if you fail to use, if you fail to warn your product user or your product consumer, there's a really good chance you're going to be sued. And failure to warn people is one of the criteria, or it's one of the arguments that's often used in product liability lawsuits when they try to prove negligence. Failure to warn is one of those. At the same time. Simply telling people to do the right thing and warning them is not enough. You need to find ways to redesign or find ways to eliminate that hazard entirely or providing safeguarding devices rather than relying on those strategies at the lower tiers of the safety hierarchy. And then my last point here, before I wrap this up, accountability is really important. If you go back to that, Failure modes and effects analysis spreadsheet, that last column is who is responsible. You need to have a responsible person. You need to show that you have at least considered the possibilities and the approaches for improving safety and reducing risk. And that needs to be assigned to a person or to a team or to a group of people within a team. And you need to make sure you track that and hold people accountable. So that's a long way of getting around to failure modes and effects analysis, a really important skill. And I'll just tell you, if you go into a workplace, if you go into a job interview, if you're an engineer and you're looking for that sweet job with De Niro tractor and machinery or a federal or state agency, and you say, I know failure modes and effects analysis, I've done comprehensive hazard and risk analysis on the things that I've designed, that's gonna put you up it's going to give you a leg up in the marketplace, especially when we begin to look at new technologies and new ways of thinking about risk and new hazards that are manifest as a result of all of this change that we see in our society and in our industry. With that, I appreciate your attention and I do look forward to the last of my three videos, which will be on human factors and the special needs that we all need to think about because we are, after all, people.